everybody that made it back out this evening. Going to, hold, going to go ahead and get things off on the right foot, and that's with prayer. I don't have any spoken requests on my right. Our children, please. Unspoke by that raised hand. Well, that's a different one. This time I'd like to ask Brother Terry Taylor if he would at least in prayer. Brother Terry? A scripture verse, a song to this. They that wait upon the Lord. That one? Oh, good. You know, come up, Miss Joyce. You and I can sing together. Into the church. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
good. All right. Well, if you know it and sing it with me, I'm, we'll sing it through a few times so they can get the tune to, to play with us, okay? Isaiah 40 and verse number 31, and he goes, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. All right. Maybe we'll get it next time. Okay, good. All right, good. All right, let's start. Uh, let's, let's switch it up just a little bit today. How about we go to Matthew chapter 6. We'll sing through the ones that we have learned. Matthew chapter 6. Come on up here, James, and sing with me. Matthew chapter 6. And at verse number 33, and you remember this, now we all sing together, then we'll split it off. Men go 7, chapter 7, verse chapter 7, verse 7, and the ladies will sing the hallelujah, okay? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, all of us together. Here we go. <clears throat> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all things shall be. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ladies, ready? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. While we have them up here to sing Philippians 4, verse number 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You probably don't need to look at that. Philippians 4, 4. Everybody together? Or not everybody together. This side starts off. Ready? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. Chapter 4, verse 7, and verse number 8. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God, he that loveth not. Knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. All right, Romans chapter 10 in verse number 13. Whosoever shall call. Romans chapter 10 in verse number 13. Ready? Whosoever shall call. Whosoever shall call, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call, whosoever shall call, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's go back over in the Old Testament. 
And let's sing, how about Isaiah 55? Let's try that one. Isaiah 55, oh, everyone that thirsted. Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2. I really like this. We have a second verse to it. Maybe we can practice that one. Do you have the tune tonight? Do you think you're ready? Oh, good. Here we go. Isaiah 55. Now we're going to sing, um, uh, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, uh, and he that hath no money, come ye by knee. Then you go to verse number two. Wherefore do you spend your money? Then we're going to go back to the latter part of verse number one and sing the second part of it. And so we'll go, um, it will go, come, let's see, come. Come ye, where is it at? Oh yeah, come ye. Where's it, where is it at, guys? <laughs> well, I don't remember. No, it's I don't remember how it goes. Hard. Oh, it's oh, you know what? It's the latter part of verse number two. The latter part of verse number two. Hard can diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let joy soul delight itself in fatness fatness that's the second verse okay we're going to concentrate on the first verse right now here we go everybody together ready oh everyone that thirsted come ye to the waters and ye that have no money come ye by verse number two wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that Satisfied not, hallelujah. Oh, everyone that thirsted, come ye to. All right, you're seeing it as though you're. It seems as though you're almost convinced that it's maybe true. Now we're going to sing it as though we are convinced that it's true. Okay, let's sing it one more time. Here we go. Oh, everyone that thirsted, come on out to the waters, and ye that have no money, come ye by verse number two. And wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hallelujah! Oh, everyone that thirsted, come ye to the water, and ye that have no money, come ye by any. We'll stop there. We'll make sure you get that one down a little bit better before we continue. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Fear thou not. Fear thou not. That's uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 7. It's actually be not wise. I say that every time. Be fear not not. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Sing it with me. Everybody. Be not wise. Be not wise. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord from evil. Be not wise, be not wise, be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord far from evil. About Psalms 89, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Everybody starts off, then the men will do a part, and the ladies will do a repeat. Ready? I will sing of the Lord. I bet I will sing, lady. I will sing. I will sing the of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Okay, men, who with my mouth will I make known, ladies? the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Men, you start off. Ladies, you sing the repeat. Psalms 118, verse 24. Psalms 118, verse 24. Men, ready? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Back up 
Psalm chapter 34, verse number 8. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Sing it with me. Men, start off, okay? The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And blessed is the man that trusteth in him. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. One more time. Ready, man? The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And blessed is the man that trusteth in him. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40. Let's sing this one more time. Are the young people singing tonight? Yeah. Well, you have my permission <laughs> to come forth. <laughs> no, the young people, come on up while we're singing this again. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. This is a new one for this week. Have I missed any of them? Did I miss any of them tonight? Oh, we sing. Oh, yes, we got to sing that one. Hold your finger here. Psalm chapter 19. We can't forget that one. I thought that I had forgotten. Isaiah, Psalm chapter 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Hold on just a minute, young people. Not yet. Let's sing this one together. Psalms 19, verse 7 and 10. 8 and 10. 9 and 10. 7, 8 and 9 are the verses, and 10 is the chorus. So you'll sing verse 10 after every verse. A wonderful song about the Word of God. All right? Here we go. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. And the honeycomb, the statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much gold, sweeter also than the honey. Verse number nine, I'm going to ask you ladies to sing the first line, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And then the men will come in and sing, The judgments of the Lord and true are true and righteous all together. All right, ladies, verse number nine, start us off. Here we go. The fear enduring forever. Okay, men. The judgments of the Lord are true. And a righteous all together. All right, everybody now. More to be desired are they than gold. Gold. Sweeter also than the honey. And the honey. Isn't that a good song? I really like that one. All right, go back to Isaiah chapter 40. And young people can come up and we'll sing this again. Make sure we have it. This is Brother Bennett's favorite, favorite song. Favorite verse of it, right? Favorite verse. I'm sorry? Not like it's not your favorite verse? Oh, it isn't? Oh, I apologize. Well, I should have heard. Maybe I should have you sing it for a second here. Yeah. Well, we'll have you teach your version next week. I'd like to hear that. Okay. Isaiah chapter 40, 31. Let's sing it together again. They, they that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They 
they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to Place to sleep. 
voice I can talk, hands I can touch, and legs I can walk, ears I can listen, eyes I can see, I've got to praise Him as long as I breathe, I have been stands for freedom and what it is worth. She stands in the harbor, Miss Liberty calls. All have gave some, but some gave it all, so we could be blessed. He's my shoulder to lean on when I Thanksgiving banquet. Amen. Amen. <laughs> bring food, bring friends, and bring facts. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. Dressing up old fashioned. Remember that. Don't forget to have your list of things. You can do join in the popcorn service as far as things that you're thankful for. All those that are participating in the baking contest. What time are you supposed to have your entry here by? <laughs> you go right ahead and have it here at 546, Pastor. <laughs> they have locks on doors for reasons. <laughs> That's what Shell does to us. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm looking forward to that good time. Yeah. Um, do be much in prayer for all those that are traveling and hunting and all that good stuff during this holiday week as well. Also on that day, there will be no ladies prayer group. No ladies prayer group. That gives those ladies plenty of time to get their entries ready for their cooking contest. And to get all the other cooking done and men get their cooking done. We've got trash can turkeys. Amen. Yeah. He's going to start on those today. <laughs> Looking forward to that. I've never had a trash can turkey. All righty. Anybody?
Anybody else have anything else? If not, we'll get a congregation and then turn Pastor Marty loose. <laughs> church tonight. Why don't you open your Bibles to Daniel chapter number 5. Daniel 5 in your Bibles. And we're going to just uh, look at a little bit here tonight in the book of Daniel. <coughs> How we doing? We doing good? Yeah. Everybody happy? Yeah. Anybody sad? Anybody want to raise your hand and complain? Brother Edwin, we ought to have a testimony time and a complaining time. Just, yeah, we ought to let them just stand up and do it. Then mock them when they complain. You know? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
Amen. Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we'll have a, uh, we're going to have a wonderful time. And so, do come ready to sing. Come ready to give your testimonies. Popcorn testimony time. And come ready to uh, enjoy. It's going to be, in, it's going to be uh, informal. But it's going to be organized. And it's going to be enjoyable. And so, we want it to be our first Thanksgiving banquet. And so, enjoyable time for us to come and to corporately thank the Lord for all of His goodness to us as His children. Amen. All right, stand with me. Let's read a verse or two of Scripture, and we're going to get into a little study tonight. Uh, Daniel chapter number 5. Are you there? Say amen. It says in verse 1, Belsajar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belsajar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. And the same hour came forth a finger of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that his joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in astrologers and uh, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Pray you'll bless our time as we look to your words. We ask, Father, that you may have full reign. We thank you that you're present with us, that you live within us. We thank you, Lord, that we have a hope of eternity today. Yeah. Thank you that you've changed us, Lord, that we've been born again. We pray that today we may experience that, even in this service, the new life, the, the heaven, a little bit of heaven, taste a little bit of it as we continue on with this service. You're so good and faithful, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll forgive me, but I, I want to give you a little bit of a background on what's taking place. This, of course, is a, a <clears throat> reference uh, to the uh, city or the country of Babylon. Belshazzar was actually the grandchild of Nebuchadnezzar. As best as I can figure, this, this event that we're reading today took place somewhere around 20, 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, in turn, he was reigned for 43 years. Nebuchadnezzar was the golden head upon the the uh, upon the uh, statue uh, that that in turn that he dreamed of that Daniel first in chapter number two that he defined for him talking about the different divisions of the kingdom. Lord Willem will get into that in this next year sometimes reading through the book of Daniel studying it. And so Nebuchadnezzar was a great king. In fact, as best I can tell, I don't know that there was ever a kingdom in comparison to Babylon. I don't know there's ever a kingdom that in turn accomplished as much as it had. At this point where we're reading tonight, Babylon had ruled supreme, a conquering country for 1,000 years. 1,000 years. And in just a moment, I'll go on to describe to you just a little bit about the dynamics of the city itself. It's quite incredible when you when you uh, begin to see a little bit, get a little bit of an understanding. I've watched, uh, looked at videos and pictures and maps of, of Babylon and tried to take it in to see uh, a little bit about the city. But it was incredible. This city was an amazing, amazing place. And so Belsazar was the, grand, the grandchild of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, I have no reason to believe that he in turn was living during the time of his grandfather. And at the very least, he certainly knew a lot about his grandfather. He had to. His, his grandfather was a very big figure in history pages. And so if we know something about him, I would imagine his grandson knew a lot more about him. Amen? And so, but I have, I believe that he was actually living uh, during the time. I could not determine. I tried to find, I just couldn't figure out actually the age uh, the Belshazzar was, uh, try to trace it back to 
to see how many years he might have lived with his grandfather during his grandfather's reign. But his father, and his father's name was uh, Nabun, Nabunidus, I think was his name, and I forgive me, these names are, are not easy to pronounce, but there had been four people that had reigned, two brother-in-laws, and Nabunus was actually, he was actually a son, and uh, a son-in-law, and four different people that had reigned in, a, in this 23, periods, 23, peri 23 years period of time. Primarily all of that was under Belshazzar's father. And so one reigned for six years, one reigned for two years, one reigned for two months, and then finally Belshazzar's father took over the kingdom. He reigned for 17 years, and Belshazzar, he, he in turn was uh, made second in command of the kingdom. And so Belshazzar stayed there in Babylon, and he ruled in Babylon. He had total authority to run and rule in Babylon. His father, he ruled outside of Babylon, and he spent, real literally, he was gone away from history records that he was away from Babylon for 10 of the 17 years that he reigned. And he spent his time going about conquering. You see, nay, nay, his, uh, his father, in turn, was trying to turn Babylon back to its original roots. Because Nebuchadnezzar made a terrible mistake. He in turn directed it to Yahweh. He directed it to God. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, he recognized there was one true God and he directed the kingdom in this way. And so we see that uh, his father and I, I continue to say his father because his name is just, uh, I have difficulty saying it. His father <clears throat> let's see if I have the enunciation here so I can say it correctly. Uh, Nabonidus. 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 Nidus. My wife's going to get me today. I go home. Nabonidus was his father's name. And Nabonidus, he, he in turn, uh, his wife was actually a priestess of the moon god. And, and they were idol worshipers. They were very, very big in idol worship. And he had the intent and purpose to not only to restore Babylon back to its original glory by capturing countries and lands that they in turn had lost over the years, but also that they could usher back in the gods that that they believe they should be worshipped as Babylonians. And so it kind of gives you a little bit of a picture of what's taking place. Uh, Belshazzar, this is the son of uh, Nabonidus, Nabonidus, uh, Nabonidus, Nidus. Forgive me, I'm trying to get it down, Nabonidus. I was born and raised in West Virginia. you got to overlook me for that. And so his uh, father, uh, Belshazzar, his father had granted him, placed him as world ruler, or ruler, I'm sorry, not world, but ruler over a Babylon as far as the city limits. And during this time, whenever this event takes place, we're going to read about this party, and starting off in chapter number 5 and verse number 1, this party, you know what was taking place on the outside of the city walls? <laughs> uh, Darius and, and the Persians had already begun their campaign to come and to overtake Babylon. In fact, in fact, history records that Nabonidus had actually had actually had a run-in. They actually fought with Darius, and he was defeated somewhere out, many miles, a great distance away, and was defeated and had to turn away. And so Darius, he continues to plow through, conquering just literally like a straight line those different lands that in turn were controlled by Babylon, and going right into the fort, right into the city walls of uh, there where the city walls are at, so that he had the intent purpose of overthrowing Babylon so that they could be the world leaders. In fact, in fact, when this was written, uh, and when this was written, Belshazzar understood they were under siege. They had camped about the outside of the city walls, and yet it was of no concern. I mean, this city, the city of Babylon, was amazing. They had enough food, they had enough substance inside of the city walls that it said that they probably could stand, uh, withstand a siege as long as 20 years, maybe even longer. A 20-year siege. And so the... Um, the walls that surrounded this, uh, <clears throat> the walls that surrounded this, uh, this city, the walls, the city itself had a diameter about 14 miles long. These walls were estimated to be somewhere. You ready for this? Somewhere around 350 feet. These walls were 87. The outer batch of walls were 87 feet wide. They could run four, um, uh, four chariots abreast on the top of the walls. Now, how they got them up there. Uh, but they could run them abreast four, four chariots along the outside, the, the top of the walls along the city. 
They had a hundred gates that were made out of brass that went around. These gates were a hundred, and these gates uh, were 80, 80 some, 87 feet that were so in height, all made out of brass that so were all around the city. Different gates, they open and shut to let people out and so forth. And then on top of that, they created a moat that went all the way around the 14 mile radius of the city walls. And this moat was supplied, the water was supplied by the Euphrates River. So the Euphrates River would run right through the center of the city. They had a gate, a brass gate that they would open and shut and this water would run right through the center of the city providing water from them. That's how they then would water and uh, you know farm and so forth so they would have the vegetation they needed. And then this water in turn was diverted to go all the way around the city. It was impregnable. Understood. People said Babylon could never be conquered at all. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. And so as we come to our text here today, we find that Belshazzar under the midst, in the middle of a siege, when he has uh, the, the Persians on the outside of the city walls and had been for some time with the extent, intent of destroying them, wanting to take them down, he decides that he's going to have a party. And he calls a party as a thousand lords that gather for this party, and they're going to have a drunken bash. Need not speak much about liquor. Maybe another time we will, but alcohol gets involved with this. But I want you to notice what happens here in verse number 2. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar, read the rest with me please, ready begin, had taken... All right, I need you to join with me now. I'll start over again. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar, ready begin, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. Stop there please. And so they actually went in inside the temple and they took the gold and silver goblets and the, the different vessels that were inside uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had actually taken out of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem whenever he, whenever he destroyed the temple and he brings these dedicated items, these items that were dedicated to the Lord's house and he brings them in and disperses them amongst the Lords and amongst his wives and his concubines and he has them all drink out of these consecrated items these items that were sacred these items which belonged to God and understand that, that this is the height of folly. This is, this, this is such a display of arrogance. On the outside of the city walls, there's a, there's a, there is a, a, a country, there is an army of men that had the intent to destroy them. On the inside of the city walls, this man, he is showing arrogantly his power and his lack of concern. And he not only disregards the men on the outside of the wall, but he also disregards the sacredness of these vessels that belong to the house of God. And he brings these vessels in and they begin to drink of them. And in the midst of them they're, they're drunken and they're lighthearted and they become very irreverent and blasphemous and in the process of this they're praising the gods of gold and the gods of silver and brass and iron and wood and stone and etc. And so a very blasphemous setting. They know where these, these uh, vessels had come from. They knew very well where they had come from. They, they specifically had had them go and get the vessels that belonged to the house of God that was taken from the land of Israel to be used and there's no other occasion that I can find that this was done that they had used these vessels in such manner and so they're drinking of this vessel praising the gods oh, let's praise God of oh, the, the God of gold and let's praise God of silver as they held up their silver cups and mocking and blaspheming the God who these, these vessels were uh, consecrated unto and in the midst of all of this we find that by the candle up against the wall that a hand, the hand from God appears and writes a message, a mysterious message upon the wall. Now we uh, will find out or you'll find out later in this passage uh, what this means. The Bible says here uh, it says here in the passage, verse number 6 then the king's countenance was changed and assaults troubled him. It would be good if our countenance be changed whenever men surround our walls on the outside. Listen, if you're losing protection in your life, you really ought to have a countenance change and wonder why. 
it would have been good, it would have been nice had his thoughts changed before he went to take these vessels that were dedicated to the house, Lord, and bring them in and desecrate them. The sac these sacred vessels that were consecrated unto God in his house and mock them, mock the God of them. That would have been nice. But no, it, it waits, he waits until afterwards and with this hand that mysteriously comes and writes upon the wall it uh, made him very 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 scared. You notice in verse number 6 his thoughts troubled him it says there that his joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. So literally literally in his hips he'd be up very weak and the Bible says that his knees they begin to the smack they begin to touch and shake against each other. This man was full of fear. He knew something, something, whatever this was, was not good. Something very bad was about to happen. In these next verses, we find that Daniel, his uh, mother, the queen, comes in. And, and the queen, she is the wife of Nabonidus. And uh, she comes in and she tries to settle her son down. And she says, you know, there is a man. That he's already called for the astrologers and of the Chaldeans. He called for people to come in and to try to interpret this message. Daniel, his mother, uh, says to him, there's a man, his name is Daniel, which is interesting to me because uh, certainly he knew of Daniel. Daniel's been in Babylon at this point 70 years. Daniel was an old man. I don't know how old, but uh, he had to have been every bit at least 80, maybe as old as 85, but he was certainly an older man. And uh, <clears throat> so he says, there's a man. This man can interpret this. And he calls him and he says to him, he says, look, if you'll interpret this, you'll tell me what it is. He said, I'll make you third in charge. First was Nabonidus. He was second in charge. He said, I'll make you third in charge. He said, I'll give you a golden chain and garments and all this. By the way, what good is it to be third in charge if your kingdom is about ready to collapse? <laughs> Daniel says, I, I don't want your money because my reward comes from God. I don't work for you. I work for God. And then he goes on to gently, I don't know if gently is the right word. He goes on to, um, he goes on to uh, carefully to explain to the king what he was doing. Before ever interpreting, he rebukes him. He talks about how his heart had been lifted up. Talks about the arrogance that he, in turn, was displaying. And then, after rebuking the king, he makes, uh, he says to him in verse number 22, can you read verse 22 with me, please? Verse 22 of chapter 5, ready? Begin. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, thou, though thou knewest all this. We know the message. He goes on to give the message and he tells them what the message means. And the message in verse number 26 means this. God hath numbered thy kingdom and, is, and finished it. And by the way, it was finished. Literally, literally, literally that night the kingdom fell. In fact, I, historians actually have the date. It was October the 12th. October the 12th of 560, uh, 556 B.C. On that night, literally while he was sitting there having his drunken party with his thousand lords, desecrating the, the vessels out of God's house, literally while they were doing that, Darius had already, on the outside, had a brilliant plan. Darius had men on the north side, the armies encamped on the north side, had armies encamped on the south side, and then he had up the Euphrates River, he had a group of a group of his men build a canal to divert the water into a lake. So they were able to drive up the Euphrates River. And when he gave word, they in turn marched through the riverbeds into the city. Unguarded, no one expected it. The gates were unlocked where the riverbeds were at, where the river flowed through. And uh, they came in and literally there was, there was no fighting. It was automatic surrender and they killed Belsajar. Impregnable city. 
there's a lot of things we can learn from this, and I, I'm just going to save it until we go back to the book of Daniel. Uh, but to what I want to just take a couple minutes and talk about, and literally only a couple minutes, is verse number 22, what, what he says here. Daniel says to him, Thou knewest all this. Thou knewest all this. Now, if you back up in your Bibles just a little bit, because the question is, what did he know? What, what did he know? You see, Belshazzar, again, was, was, had to be living during his grandfather and, and, during, and was aware, had some understanding of what his grandfather had gone through. Listen, if my grandfather had become an animal and he's walking around on all fours, hey, let's go see Grandpa, and he's out in the field eating grass, I think I'd remember that. <laughs> and you know how curious children are. Why is he like that? Why is our Grandpa like a horse or a cow? Why is he like, what, and we are like human. Why is that? And someone, no doubt, offered some, you know, would tell the story, well, this is what is said. And so we understand that Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, as you go through chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 of these chapters, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar's journey, he was called the servant of God, used to bring, into the, to bring Israel to judgment. He drug off Israel two different times. He brought in, he conquered, and finally conquered, and completely leveling the city. And he brought back the, the best, the cream of the crop, into the city. And there in the city... He, in turn, experiences first that dream. And then uh, after the dream, chapter number 3, he builds this statue, the golden idol, and forces everybody to bow down to it, which we had the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then in chapter number 4, and chapter 4, it was in chapter 4 when Nebuchadnezzar walks out and he says on his banisher, says, Is it not this Nebuch you know, Babylon, the great city that I have built? And immediately, while the words were still in his mouth, the Bible said that he, God spoke, and he in turn became an animal. It was on all fours. For seven years, he was in a pastor, pastor, and he uh, ate grass and was an animal. For seven years. And you're in chapter number four. Can you look there with me? Chapter number four. These are the last words we know that Nebuchadnezzar spoke. Uh, verse number 36, At the same time my reason returned unto me, for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. And this is after. God in turn, after seven years, we see it was called in verse number 34, the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven. After seven years, he in turn looks up to heaven and acknowledges there a God. By the way, I believe Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven with me. I believe Nebuchadnezzar in turn this was a, his time of conversion where he placed his faith in the almighty God and this happened after the seven years and in verse number 37 now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to abase my friend, this became, this became the message of Nebuchadnezzar. This became his life was in turn to, to live and to teach and to exalt the God of heaven. And that's what Daniel meant whenever he said, Thou knewest all this. You see, Belshazzar is here and he's walking in pride. He's full of himself. The foolishness is abounding. And then he makes a mistake like his grandfather made a mistake. His grandfather said, Is not this Babylon the great city that I have built? And his grandson's over here. And on his occasion, he says, Bring to me these vessels because they belong to me. And I can do with them whatever I want to do. They're mine. And God, in turn, humbles Balthasar, just like, in turn, he humbled Nebuchadnezzar. There's a lot of applications from all of this, but what I want to leave us with tonight is just, is just this thought. Thou knewest all this. And we could journey through scriptures and look at many occasions like Solomon. 
or Uzziah or Nadab and Abihu. So many examples of people in scriptures in, in there, in history, that in turn, that, that they could look past. Solomon could look back, and he in turn knew what scriptures had taught. He knew the judgments that fell upon the children of Israel, individually and, and corporately. He understood that, but yet we find that he was guilty of going and worshiping to a false god as well. We know that. We know that Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, they did the same thing. They, they in turn knew. They knew what God's Word said. They, they knew and they had seen examples of this, but yet they were guilty of strange fire. And God took their life immediately. Uzziah, he knew, he understood you know, the, the sacredness of the Ark of the Covenant. And yet he in turn touches the Ark of the Covenant and immediately he dies. We find illustration after illustration of this. And not only those, but we find those ones, those Gentile countries like the Philistines, whenever they got the Ark of the Covenant and they opened it up and peeked inside and 55,000 people died because of it. We have so many illustrations of this. Thou knewest all this. You knew. And when you read over the pages of history, it's hard for us to understand. We, we know. Why is it? I mean, why is it that we know? One man said that the one thing we learn from history is that we never learn from history. Even what we're going through as a country right now, we have historical examples of exactly what we're facing at this moment. And what we're learning is that we've gotten to this point because we haven't learned from history. You see, we as Christians, we in turn should be people that walk in the fear of the Lord. That, that we, we so respect and honor the Lord. That we're so attuned. We believe that our God is consistent. That our God is just. That our God in turn is holy. And that we look at stories in the scriptures. Like even the story we're reading tonight. And we understand that, you know, that that could be me. Yet so many, so many times Christians become careless. Careless in their life. And they act as though that they're going to be the exception to the rule. That uh, in turn, <clears throat> it really won't matter with them. God, God, may God give us a fear of Him. That we fear His words. That we fear what He says. That we fear, in turn, that we may reap things that we sowed. I'm talking negative seeds. That we may, we may, in turn, not live a long life because we didn't honor and obey our parents. That we, in turn, might have our life short and that judgment may come. May we have a fear of God. We, as Christians, we dwell in knowledge. We have so many examples of people that hold bitterness and what happened to them. We have so many examples of people that embraced immorality and what happened to them. So many examples of people who became unfaithful. Unfaithful to church and unfaithful to their walk with the Lord and what happened to them. And we're not pointing fingers or judging any of those people, but we have two eyes and two ears and one mouth. These things, as we talked about last Sunday night, were written for your example for you to learn. We have so much history that we can look at of people in our lives of that uh, they just they were proud and cocky and arrogant and what happened to them? They were know-it-alls and what happened to them? They in turn wouldn't follow authority and what happened to them? They in turn they, they were sneaky and they were liars and they were deceitful and what happened to them? You know all this. You know it. But yet Belsazer somehow in his mind, he found his security in these walls, the walls that he was surrounded by, in this impregnable city that he lived within, in his thousand year historical reign, you know, in his vast food supply. He found his security in all of these things. But yet God, without, without even a fight, God calls this city to fall. And 
Daniel is here telling him. He knew this. You, you knew all this. You, you saw this with your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Your grandfather, in turn, was proud and arrogant, and God gave him opportunities, and, and he would not yield himself, and he came even to the point that he began to embrace and give glory unto himself, and God smote him. You remember going to visit your grandfather, Belsazar? And seeing him in the field walking around, eating grass. You knew this. Now I ask you this question, what do you know? What have you in your lifetime, what have you seen? What do you know? And my second question is, are you living as though you know that? Or are you living as though you're ignorant of it? You knew all this, and yet you still, still, you refuse to follow, refuse to, to do what's right. Still, you decided to desecrate those vessels of London. Still, you decided to show in this display of arrogance and, and what you felt was invinci invincibleness. Still, you knew. And God will humble you just like He humbled your grandfather. And God will humble you just like He humbled the person that you know. Take heed lest ye fall. That's what Scripture says. Take heed lest ye fall. And so there's something interesting about how we mature. I, I watching my children grow. I, I thought it interesting to see they were so humble when they were when they were crawling, and as they took those first steps, they 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 were so humble and and excited. And then as they became more comfortable with walking, you could see almost a a boldness and a cockiness that entered into them. And I watched that stage, every stage in their life, it seemed as though they, when they would first come to the stage, there was humility, but yet once they got a little comfortable with it, then they were cocky and they were bold. And I thought, Lord, I'm the same way. That I have humility because I don't know, but then after I know how to do something and how to live and how whatever, I get a lot of confidence and I get cocky and I get bold about it. Now listen, just because you've been a Christian as long as you have Brother Bob or Brother Beckett doesn't mean you can't fall. And just long because I'm a preacher doesn't mean that I in turn can't stumble. <coughs> and be a recipient of God's judgment because He has to correct me because I've given way to my flesh. I know much. And you know much because we've seen a lot. I've been in church now for well, almost 40 years. Faithfully attending. I've seen a lot of people come and go. And about anything you can come up with, I've seen. And about anything you can imagine happen, I've watched it happen. I've seen a lot. Two eyes and two ears and one mouth. Now the question is, I know it. Now what am I going to do with my knowledge? What am I going to do with my knowledge? And Belsazar, he disregarded it. May God help us to be good stewards of the knowledge we have and to walk in His fear. Father, we thank You. We pray that You'd help us, Lord, to be, to be faithful, to remain faithful, to be humble, and to remain humble. Lord, I pray that we will not be judgmental of people in our past, like Nebuchadnezzar's, who had great folly and great falls. As though we could not. <clears throat> people that have made mistakes, they have lost their marriage, or people that whose children, in turn, they had trouble with them, or maybe in turn they lost a job, or maybe, Lord, uh, it may be, uh, I don't know what it may be. But we've watched a lot. All of us have. We've seen a lot. I pray, Lord, that we our knowledge will make us humble, not proud. And Lord, all that we have seen that will make us even the more not fearful of man, 
but fearful of you. And we'll understand there's high stakes in this game of life. There's much for us to lose. And that we just stay humble before you. And remember, remember the consequences of all those ones in the past that we've seen who have forsaken your words and decided to walk our own path. Lord, help us to use our knowledge aright. In Jesus' name. Our head and bowed and eyes closed. Stand with us, please. Brother Mark, if you'll lead us, or lead us in song. 291. or enter your uh, your your uh, cake or pie or cookie. That's what it is. All right. Anyway, so uh, <clears throat> keep that in mind. I encourage all of you, try to get here a little bit earlier because we can start at 6 o'clock. And so I'd like to start right at 6 if we could. We're going to begin with eating. Get that done first. So we need you here ahead of time so you have your food on the on the tables uh, to be ready to serve, prepared so they can be ready to serve. Okay. All righty. Well, with that in mind, I guess we'll uh, have a prayer of dismissal, and uh, then we'll go home. Brother Donnie, can you lead us in prayer, brother? Can you lead us in prayer?